let's start off with just a little bit of your background, where you're from, uh, any interesting stories from childhood, and things that led up into when you joined the Navy. There are people that, you know, when you're young and you have uh, the whole future in front of you, and, you, and what happens is a, a person of influence just makes a comment or just gives you, uh, asks you a question that changes the direction of your life. Well, the night before my physical for the Navy, I, I was celebrating the night before and um, and celebrated a little bit too much so that when I had the had the uh, uh, exam the next day, I failed the vision, uh, vision portion of the physical. So here I am. I'm walking up the steps to the Navy ROTC building and the commanding officer of the Navy ROTC, who you don't really deal with much but as seniors, he knows every one of us. And he says, Minchiman Craft. He says, I have a question for you. And he said, yes, sir. And he goes, um, I expected you to sign up for aviation. And I said, well, sir, I failed the physical. He says, then I, I ask you a question. Were you drinking the night before? And I said, yes, sir. And he says, would you be willing to have that physical over, you know, take the vision test again? And I said, well, yes, sir. And he turns to the gunny and says, gunny? Take my car, take Kraft down, get them checked for his vision. vision. And sure enough, I get tested that morning and my vision is 2010, 2015, and, uh, and I'm into the, then I get selected for aviation out of, uh, out of the Navy ROTC, Ensign, and I'm on my way to Pensacola to uh, start flight training. So, three months out of college, I'm flying that right there. That's the T-34. Basically, all they teach you in this whole thing when you're flying a T-34 is basic aviation. It's just uh, flight rules, um, how to be a pilot. No different than uh, flying a Cessna, only this is a military trainer and fully acrobatic. It was a very fun airplane to fly. One of the first things they teach you flying this airplane was if anything goes wrong, do just the opposite of what you were doing. If it keeps happening, you're probably putting the controls in the wrong place, so do the opposite of what you've been doing. And I did very well there, and I graduated first in my class in, uh, from flight school at, at primary, and got picked for jets. This is a T-2 Buckeye. I flew it up in Meridian, Mississippi. Going from the uh, T-34 to this aircraft, the, the Buckeye was quite the transition because it's going twice as fast at liftoff, and you get there twice as fast, or more, even more. And so you're already up to speed, usually when your brain doesn't even know when, what's happened on your first one or two flights. Once you've finished carrier quals, you move on to advanced jets the F-9 Cougar. I think it was the first carrier-based jet the Navy had. We'd fire guns and, and strafe and all that at, at the, out on the range in, uh, in Texas, which is always fun. It was always fun doing this stuff, especially if you never had to go to war, which I didn't. Well, it looked great in the air. It, looked, it was probably the ugliest airplane on the ground. Uh, and it's all about looks, you know, when you're a naval aviator. We were the last group to be trained in the F-9. After that, all, all the uh, pilots being trained after us were uh, in the a transition to A-4s. Out of 30 pilots getting their wings at this time, I'm like 15. I'm right in the middle of the pack. And the first guy gets to pick whatever, you know, whatever, like A-6s, F-4s, A-7s. Those are the three fleet seats and you want to you want a fleet seat you want to go to a carrier based aircraft and you want to be in the action that's what you were being trained for so like three weeks before i'm to get my wings i have orders to ov10s i'm going what the heck is an ov10 and you look it up it's a it's a turboprop and it looks like a cobra helicopter with a high wing and uh twin tails and it's it flies low and it flies slow and it and it's a Fort Air Observer and a gunship 
for uh, supporting the Marines on, on the, and it's land-based. And so that's, that was where I was heading. I was heading to Vietnam, OV-10s. And then three, but three weeks before that happened, before I got my wings, the detailer calls me and says, Jim, says, uh, we're, I'm having to change your orders. You're, you're not going OV-10s. We're gonna send you to the Naval Missile Center Point Magoo. What happened to the OV-10s, they, they got caught on the ground in, uh, in Vietnam on the base. It was a night attack and they all got destroyed. Again, something happened to keep me from going to Vietnam. Well, the Naval Missile Center Point Magoo, they have every aircraft that the Navy flies and they're doing missile separation tests and getting the F-14 accepted into the fleet. And that would be what I would be doing for the next, basically it ended up being three years. And now the F-14, during the trials, we realized that the F-14 had a problem with its gun camera. When it's tracking four, through four Gs on a target, the gun camera would cut off. Grumman was trying to deal with what's causing it, you know, when exactly does it come on? Does it do it in all directions and all that? So I was briefed with a Grumman pilot, said, okay, what I need you to do is in the A4, you fly up to 22,000 feet and we're gonna roll 45 degrees to the rising and I want you to pull the bottom portion the, from the top to the bottom of a loop and just pull four Gs. And then as you do that, come back up, get to 22,000 feet. And now let's roll to the right and do it. We're gonna do it over and over and over again. So he's behind me and I, I roll to the left and I pull four Gs and he and he's tracking behind me. Now that the fourth time he comes up and he roll to the right. And so I roll to the right and I pull four Gs and immediately the airplane just departs flight and it is tumbling through the air. I'm thrown around, you know, just up into the canopy all over the place and uh, although I'm strapped in, but the airplane is just violently shaking, rolling and stuff, and I, I can't figure it out. So then my angle attack was like level. It was like nothing, you know? So I'm going, I'm screaming through the air and I'm diving. So it's like, you start at 22,000 feet and you watch your, you look at your altimeter and it's going 20, 19, 18, and it's just, whoa. So then every, and every time I pull the stick, it departs again and throws me through this violent, oscillation and stuff and then it stabilizes nose down and I'm passing through 10,000 feet out of control the mandate is you punch out um, so I'm coming up on 10,000 feet and I have no control on this airplane and so I, the only thing that immediately I there's like a voice uh, and I believe it was a voice uh, spoke to me and says do absolutely the opposite of everything you're doing I took my feet off the rudders Immediately, I took the stick and I threw it forward, so I hadn't put two negative G's on the airplane, and then, and the airplane stabilized, and I was, I was in the vertical. Turns out I was like nose down, and I started pulling, and it didn't depart. So then I just pulled, you know, I'm doing 450, 500 miles an hour, and I'm going straight down to the deck, and I've passed through 10 like easy. I'm pulling like six Gs, and I bottomed out somewhere between 50 and 200 feet. I mean, I came right down to the deck on the water, and, and then came back up. At that point, my, uh, I could hear the radios came back on, and Grum, the Grumman pilot says, that's good, 204, we got enough, let's take it back. So then, so I said, Roger, and I just come up and I get on his wing and we fly in to Point Magoo. Do the break, he breaks, so I break, come in, land. Then all, you go in and they said, anything to report? I said, yeah, I pulled six Gs on the airplane. Here we go in the F-4 Phantom. It was the last aircraft I flew in the, at Naval Missile Center and it was a rocket ship. Afterburner. Great looking airplane on takeoff. Love the look of it. Just everything about the F-4 is cool. One of the missions that happens every quarter 
at the Naval Missile Center is they, they just take a random sample of uh, Sidewinder missiles, Sparrow missiles, the different missiles that they're firing out of the fleet, and they take them randomly out of what was going to the fleet, and they send them to the missile center, and we have to shoot them and make sure they're working and tracking and doing their job. It's basically a quality check. So here it is, it's a Friday, and it's at the end of the month, and it happens to be at the end of the quarter, and there was a celebration going on at the officers club. We normally call it happy hour. So all the fighter pilots and all the attack pilots were at the club and I was a junior guy and I was had to finish putting up the schedule for the next week so everybody knew what was going on. So the chief and I and my first class are all doing the board and getting it all ready and in walks the, you know, one of the Brios or the back seaters for the F4 fighter group and they say, uh, since I was qualified in the F4, he comes to me and says, uh, Hey, Crafty, we have a flight. We got two sparrows we need to, to fire, and uh, all everybody has been at the club for a couple hours. We can't call them back, so uh, you're you're going to get to shoot the shoot the sparrows this this quarter. And I'm going, whoa, okay. So with two, I think I have two sparrows on on board, and we we fly up and uh, climb to altitude. And there's a live drone, one of those orange babies coming coming at us and he has it on radar and they you know we get to a certain range he says okay arm arm the sparrow and i arm the sparrow and he says okay when you pull the trigger he says it's going to come off and we'll drop down and we'll come up over the aircraft he says then pull the nose up and roll so we can watch it and i pull the trigger sparrow comes off so i pull the nose up and i roll and we watch it track and, it, and you can see the the orange coming at it and this thing and boom just explodes in the air and go, oh that was so cool Well, we have a full tank of gas. We need to do something with this. I said, what's that? And he says, well, have you ever done Mach 2? And I said, no, are you kidding me? I haven't done Mach 1. And he goes, he says, well, let's, let's see what we can do about that. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take it and you're gonna go full afterburner and go screaming up, go vertical. Approaching 45, 50,000 feet. And so now go zero G and, he, and take us over the top zero G. And, and he says, I don't think we're going to get to Mach 2 because it had you know, all the racks on it to hold the sparrows. And, and he says, it'll be your one time you get to try. So, oh, well, you know, sure enough, we go to 45,000 feet and I start pitching. I go through 50, 55, and I come over, over the top. And you can actually see the curvature of the earth up there at that point. And now I'm coming down, screaming down in afterburner. And, and so then it's like, and watch the Mach meter, and we went through one Mach 1, 1 1.0, just like nothing. And then it goes, then it went Mach 1.87 was a high, you know, it was as fast as I could get. And he says, yeah, it wasn't you, it was that, you know, it was the racks on the airplane. So we came back in, landed, taxied in, two of us go head over to the officer's club and walk in, and my Rio says, says you losers, not only did Kraft shoot off two Sparrow missiles, he got the 1.87 today. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a pretty good day. Yeah, yeah. Typical Friday at the club, you know. I'm flying the flight pattern of, of a missile that's being shot off an A6. Comes off, goes down to the uh, to sea level and then tracks in and is attacking a ship down there on, on, in, on the ocean. I do the pattern of the, of the uh, missile and I drop down, but the problem is there's cloud cover all below. There's strict instructor. You do not fly through a solid cloud level, no matter what. You have to go visual flight rules only. You have to be able to find a hole and fly through that to get down. But I didn't see it, so I just flew directly over the ship at the as low as I could go, and that was up and above the clouds. Come back up and uh, join up on an A3 and get tanked, so I refuel in air. And after I've refueled and I'm heading back to the A6, I am told that the, the uh, captain of the ship referred to the, um, the naval aviator that just flew or missed that he couldn't see because I was above the clouds as chicken shit. I didn't really like the comment myself, so I, I joined back up on the A6, and the A6 pilot, you know, he, he calls it away, 
and I, and I fly the pattern again. This time I'm flying down and I am looking for a hole and I circle and I find a hole and I pop through the hole and now I'm down, I like to fly low, so I was down around 50 feet on the, off the water and I'm in and out of afterburner. See, if it's not an afterburner, the F4 makes black smoke, so you can actually see it. So I'm, I wanted to be an afterburner, but I had to, I didn't want to be, I didn't want to boom him. So I come, because he would have reported me, but I am right on the edge. So I come over and, and I cross over that, the bow of the ship and the, you can see the, you can see the bridge and I can see the captain with a cup of coffee, or at least it's pictured in my mind, exactly as Maverick going by and that coffee going up into his lap. And I just, I go over the bow of the ship and I just pulled straight up and right, right through the clouds and just boom, and I knew that I racked that boat and, and then I'd come back to A6 and I'm coming back down. And this, this, so the, the, the controller says, uh, Bulldog uh, 204, uh, the uh, captain of the ship asked, could you elevate it and leave, and could you please not be an afterburner and you're approaching? <laughs> Just said, uh, you know, he wanted, he wanted to be able to see me, you know? <laughs> He probably had to change his pants too. So anyway, anyway, that's that's the black shoe navy for you. That was F four. There was other things that happened with that. It was a great airplane to fly. I would love to fly it again someday. But now they're all in the museum. Um, all the airplanes I flew are in the museum right now. <laughs> yeah, my kid when he was rotten kid, uh, he was I think. 11 years old, 10 or 11. And we're at the Air and Space Museum in Seattle. And we're walking around the airplanes. My dad's with us. And uh, there's an A4, a Blue Angel A4, um, the number four on it up in Seattle. And I'm looking at the tail number and I'm going, oh, I have that tail number in my flight book. I flew that, that was the Super Fox that I told you about earlier. Uh, now it's in the museum in Seattle. And my son says, oh dad, Look at this. You're so old that all the airplanes you've ever flew are in the museum. Kids, right? Take them and shoot them. Anyway, um, I look back and I'm going, I can't believe that I had the privilege to do all of these different things, all because a few people decided that, to take interest in me and, and just help me along the way, help me, like when I'm confused or whatever, there's always been somebody that came in and has helped me make the right decisions. I'm, I'm nothing, I mean, I just, I got to have fun in a time when there was war and I didn't have to go. So I've had 21 years in the Navy um, I, and retired as a commander. That's my story, I'm sticking to it.